This week, Johnny Robot gets in the mood for a little bit more Destiny with his alpha preview. I go hands-on with the brand new Parrot Mini Drones ahead of their August launch, and we catch up with Victor Antonov, creative director on brand new Bethesda game, Battlecry. This is Player Attack. Hi, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this week Sega caused a bit of a kerfuffle when it announced a pre-order DLC plans for Alien Isolation. Specifically, the company confirmed the film's original cast had teamed up with the Creative Assembly to record not one, but two extra gameplay missions for the game. Sounds pretty great, huh? That's what we thought until Sega announced the extra content was only available as a pre-order bonus for gamers who shopped at specific retail outlets. Following some incredible gamer backlash, Sega backflipped, announcing that the extra missions would be available to everybody after all at a later date. In other news, Cliff Blazinski is back in the headlines as he makes his glorious return to the games industry more than a year after leaving Epic Games. Now, the man known as Cliffy B is heading up his own studio, Boss Key Productions, working with Arjan Brissi, another Epic veteran who went on to become co-founder of Killzone developer Guerrilla Games. The two men had worked together previously on Jazz Jack Rabbit 2, but we've already been told that the new studio's debut title, codenamed Blue Streak, will be a first-person shooter. And it'll be free to play. Cliff's former employer, Epic, is also working on new things, taking a moment to re-reveal Fortnite, which has been in the works for what feels like forever. Atlas activated. Now defend the Atlas until the gate has been closed. If you want, you can sign up for the Fortnite Alpha Test. Epic's already told us that some gamers will be led into the game this year, while the rest of us will just have to wait until 2015. Last week, Riot Games shut down all the chat rooms for League of Legends as it combated the game's spam problem. This week, it's taken another step, deactivating all previously issued skin codes for the game. This time, the studio is working to squish the software black market where nefarious no-goods have been selling the promise of limited edition skins for ridiculous prices and then not delivering. Don't worry, if you've bought legitimate skins in the past, you'll still get to keep them. If you have skin codes now that you haven't redeemed, contact Riot, they should help you out. A few quick things now, Double Fine has reassured old school gamers with the developer confirming that yes, the HD remake of Grim Fandango is indeed coming to PC, Mac and Linux as well as PlayStation 4 and Vita. Gearbox Software is reportedly terrified by the concept of living up to people's expectations of Borderlands 3, so the studio is taking a little bit of a break to work on Battleborn, a brand new game it refers to as a hero shooter. That is, a genre-fused, hobby-grade, cooperative and competitive FPS exploding with eye-popping style and an imaginative universe. It's due out next year sometime. A news leak has forced Katsushira Harada to confirm that Tekken 7 is in development, even though he hadn't really planned on revealing the game quite so early. Apparently, the developer is currently working on two other unannounced games, but fans demanded more Tekken, and that's what they got. More details will be revealed at this year's San Diego Comic-Con. And finally this week, we're hearing rumours that the Thief franchise is the next video game to make the jump to the big screen, with an adaptation apparently in the works from the teams behind the Lego movie and the film based on Hitman. There isn't much detail floating out about the project just yet though, so we'll flip to the other side of the coin where a much beloved film is jumping the other way and becoming a video game. Sharknado is coming to iOS. Thanks to the team at Other Ocean, the studio behind NBA Rush and upcoming ID at Xbox title, iDarb. It's an endless runner that promises to be in the spirit of the film, that is ridiculous, overblown, yet oddly sincere. And yes, you will be able to fly into the heart of Sharknado with a chainsaw, destroying it from the inside. That one's out this month. For more details on any of these stories, or to keep up to date with the latest gaming news, head to playerattack.com. But for now, stick around, we've got plenty more still to come.
pleasure to be standing here with Viktor Antonov, who you may know from games like Half-Life 2, Dishonored, and now this brand new project, Battlecry. Can you tell us what is Battlecry? Well, first of all, it's a very brand new thing because it's only 10 months old, so I'm very excited about it. It started last March. Of course, it's an online battle multiplayer game of its own kind. Um, so it's a very intense adrenaline driven game where you have a lot of powerful face-to-face -face combat and just strong adrenaline experiences. Where's the gunpowder? Uh, the same place where chemical warfare and nuclear weapons are today, it's banned, it's illegal, because um, big European empires have decided to wage civilized war. Therefore, World War I would be less barbaric, less civilian casualties and less material casualties, damages. So it's a clean, old-fashioned war, let's say, and it's a paradox between the, you know, the beauty of the imperial uniforms and the savage violence of World War I trenches. Why did you decide to go with such a, a painterly style for this rather than making something more realistic? Um, this is really related to the game experience, which is a very short experience and a very intense one. So in this game, the cycle is about five minutes, four to five minutes, and then you die. Um, and I was interested in like, what is this experience like? What did a World War I soldier feel in the trenches when he thought he was about to die and shell shock? And in these moments when we're full of adrenaline, we don't perceive reality like we do every day. Um, colors are stronger, details disappear, and everything has a surreal feel to it. So this is why I wanted to make really expressive perceptions and only form, essential forms and symbols remain. So, just backtracking a little bit, even though gunpowder has been banned, it's, you're not just fighting with sticks and stones in this. No, it's, um, it's much like Roman gladiators arena, to make a good parallel. Um, the reasons for war are similar, they're territory and trade. Um, so, it's a real allegorical World War I, where, again, European empires are trying to have a clean war where civilians don't get hurt and private property is never damaged. We have a man with a mechanical arm, we have a Cossack faction. Uh, that was another thing that was important for us because there's so much said about the world west and the frontier um, Texas areas and not enough about Central Europe. So I wanted to get in, into that mythology and you know explore the myths of the Cossacks. So there's a lot of variety of which faction, depending on which faction you get to play. And there's also always a little bit of over the top adventure feel to each character. But the other thing that we are obviously talking about is the, the classes. There are three classes that are playable here and there are two more that are coming later. Can you introduce us? Sure. Um, the classes depend really on the player's personality and how you, def how you choose to approach combat. It could be in a very, again, savage and brutal way when you have close melee classes, like the guy with the mechanical arm, the brawler. You can be much more sophisticated and elegant being the duelist, or you can be more strategical and work from distance like the archer. So it's based on how you want to approach combat. You've got girls in your game. Absolutely, yes. Uh, well, it's important. Why, why have girls in the game? Because in, it's this society where warriors are like a sa sacred race, um, and they, there were cases like this, and it, it was important to get some girl heroes out there right now when there's a few but not enough by far and um, you know there's girls in the US Army today and in all armies so I want to just to you know start and and try to write a few stories about war you know war girl soldiers uh, working with a comic book artist by the way called Francisco Ruiz Velasco who's um, who's worked with Guillermo del Toro for all of his feature films and he joined us to design the characters and we're also making a comic book that's the origins of each character at the moment. I'm really looking forward to that. The characters look amazing, the game looks amazing. Can you tell us 
Tell us about the war effort, which is the persistent side of things. Yeah, we're we're putting this together right now, so you'll be seeing it in the next phases. But basically, you'll be able to keep track of the bigger picture and how your um, battle experiences influences the bigger map of war. And if your country and your faction is making progress or losing, and just get a, a much bigger picture of allegorical World War One front and a propaganda channel that will tell you about how you're doing on a bigger scale. Back in 2010, French company Parrot introduced the AR Drone, a nifty little flying quadcopter controlled entirely by your smartphone or tablet. Now, four years later, the company would like you to meet the drone's little brothers, the mini drones. The rolling spider and jumping sumo are also controlled by your smartphone, actually using the same app as the AR Drone, but they've been designed to be just a little bit different. First up, the rolling spider. This is obviously a teeny tiny version of the AR drone we've met before. The studio calls it ultra compact. So as you can see, the product is super small. So what is it? It's a micro-sized, ultra compact uh, micro drone. So uh, it's very, very light. It's very, very agile. It's super high tech and it's very, very robust. So this product weighs uh, around about 55 grams. It is very, very easy to fly. Uh, you control it via Bluetooth from your smartphone or your tablet. Uh, and it's, as, a, as we say, it's about putting the fun back into toys. Now, obviously, the rolling spider didn't earn its name because it can fly. Instead, it comes with a set of detachable wheels. Clip them on and your flying machine becomes a little lightweight rolling robot. It can climb walls, move across the ceiling and generally defy gravity. So we took all of the, um, uh, uh, the intelligence, um, we took all of the development from the bigger brother, the AR drone. Um, we put all of the sensors into this product, so it's very, very stable. Um, it will hover, it's uh, one touch um, to fly. Uh, everything controlled via the uh, app that comes on Android, iOS and later for um, Windows 8.1. Um, and you can really show off and be a true uh, professional pilot within a few seconds of downloading the free app. You have a one-touch takeoff, uh, acrobatic movements, just a swipe of the app, and you can really, really show off like a, like a true pro. One sacrifice that Parrot has made by making the new drone so much smaller is that the rolling spider has lost most of its camera functionality. The new model uses low power Bluetooth to communicate with your smartphone, so it means that it can no longer stream video footage. It does have an onboard camera that can take photos, but if you really want something for aerial footage, this one might not be the best solution for you. However, if you want something super tiny and really agile, the rolling spider is definitely that. And to add to the cute factor, it's been programmed with a thrown launch. When you want to fly, gently throw the drone into the air, like releasing a dove, and the onboard sensors will spin the rotors into life. It's a little reminder that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The concept came uh, in 2005, so uh, it started out life as a remote control car. Uh, worked on Bluetooth. Uh, I remember seeing the car the first time I met our um, CEO and founder in 2005. Um, it had an embedded camera, you controlled it via Bluetooth. Uh, and Henri Sadu, our founder, said to me that uh, we're going to make it fly. And then uh, five years later, as technology caught up, uh, the car uh, flew and the car became the first generation AR drone, which we launched in 2010, and then uh, the second generation in uh, 2012. Parrot's second mini drone is probably my favourite of the two. The jumping sumo is all about having fun, showing off and making people smile, all by using a whole bunch of newfangled technology. I had the chance to go hands on with the jumping sumo, controlling it with an iPhone, and I'm happy to report that it is every bit as responsive as Parrot promises. It uses the iPhone's accelerometer to steer and the touchscreen controls forward and backward movement. 
The touchscreen also controls one other thing too, the patented spring-mounted system that gives the jumping sumo its name, that is, the ability to jump 80 centimetres in the air. It's got two modes. Um, you have the uh, rapid mode at the moment, which is the with the wheelbase in this uh, current position here, and then you've got a precision mode where you just push the wheelbase in, and then when it's in the precision mode, it will then very, very simply uh, do very, very tight turns uh, and uh, really uh, 180, 360 turns, all on a pin, so to speak. The jumping sumo is controlled by Wi-Fi and it does contain the same sort of wide angle camera like we've seen in the AR drone. You can take photographs through the app and use your smartphone or tablet to get a sumo eye view. It really is a very, very clever little piece of technology. Even if you start attempting really tricky jumps and manoeuvres, it will always land on its feet, able to roll away or jump again. And performing those tricky moves is actually really easy. Parrot has programmed the sumo with a whole bunch of pre-configured show-off moves that can be controlled with one touch or strung together in something Parrot calls a road plan. So I can, uh, I can say in the app that I want it to go straight for two metres. At two metres I want it to turn 90 degrees left. Uh, at 90 degrees left I want it to do an 80 centimetre jump. Uh, and then I can save the itinerary. I can just press one button in the app and it will go off and do its, uh, uh, do its thing uh, fully automated. Both of the Parrot Mini Drones will be available in Australia in August and you can pre-order either one, or both, online or from selected retailers right now. The Rolling Spidey Mini Quadcopter is $139.99, while the Jumping Sumo Robot is $219.99. <laughs>
I dutifully accepted my crown as king of terrible life choices by promptly charging at a group of alien warlords whilst firing my sniper rifle from the hip. So needless to say, it wasn't long before searing plasma bolts and large chunks of shrapnel were in and around my face. But it was in this moment of frantic scrambling for cover and desperation to keep my robot lungs doing whatever it is robot lungs do that the old muscle memory kicked in. Within seconds of hearing that celestial electronic chorus associated with a recharged overshield, I boosted from cover like a jetpack bestowed banshee, iron sighting suckers with mathematical precision and putting them down with a single crack from my hunting rifle. That, my friends, is a testament to the controls and gameplay. They're tight, they're responsive, and they're intuitive. If you've ever so much as dabbled in the FPS genre, your trigger fingers will feel totally at home here on Destiny. But Destiny's beautiful design is not limited solely to its mastery of hurling chunks of lead at enemies. No, it's in every frame, every orchestral note, and more importantly, the marriage between the two. The environmental designs and musical score portrays everything you need to know. Abandoned ramshackled bunkers, office floors littered with personal effects, earth ravaged by mortar crates and downed passenger jets. Russia is a graveyard and a monument to loss. This feeling of emptiness is only compounded by Martin O'Donnell's amazing score. You may know him from a little known franchise called Halo. Sparse and reflective one minute, only to erupt into a sweeping orchestral battle cry once bullets start to fly. Very, very minor annoyances aside, Destiny is our first big step as a console market to truly next-gen experiences. The visuals are jaw-dropping, the frame rate is consistent, huge deal, and the gameplay is solid, and most importantly of all, it's straight up fun. If you've ever enjoyed a Halo game, get psyched. If you've ever blasted Skags in Borderlands, get psyched. If you've ever mercilessly butchered rats to farm XP in every MMO RPG ever in existence, get psyched. Destiny grabs all of these elements and shoves them together and says, Come on, champ. Enjoy yourself. You've earned it. I wonder if it's possible to replace my dad with this game. That's about it for this edition of Player Sack. Thanks for watching. Next week, Johnny shares his thoughts on Watch Dogs now that the hype's died down a bit. Did Aiden Pierce live up to our expectations? Jimmy the Geek debunks all your ideas about why a Superman video game will suck, and I chat with a team working on Sharknado for iOS about their other game, the odd little ID at Xbox game, iDarb. In the meantime, you can catch us on playerattack.com. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you've got something you want to say, send us an email, mailbox at playerattack.com, or just hop on our forums. Till next week, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this is Player Attack.